Hello and welcome friends once again to the India Today South Conclave 2023. We are coming to you from Kovalam in Kerala. A long way away from Delhi and in many ways this distance has become for many a source of friction. In fact the growing divide between an all-powerful center and state governments has become a, a running narrative of our times and one that possibly poses huge challenges for the constitutional vision of a federal India. What is the future of Indian federalism? How will the north-south divide play out in the years ahead? And indeed, more importantly, the growing concern of a divide between center and states. Who better to answer some of these questions than my guest today? He has been both finance minister and the home minister of the country Please welcome Mr. P. Chidambaram. <laughs> Mr. Chidambaram, am I exaggerating these cons this concern that many opposition parties in particular have over the future of cooperative federalism? Or do you believe that this is going to become a major friction point in the years ahead? In my view, you are understating the problem. Understating it. Yes, you're not exaggerating. <clears throat> Every state is now bristling with a kind of encroachment which the center is making into its executive powers and legislative powers. And therefore, I think the problem, if it's not addressed uh, up front with reasonable debate, will become more and more acute. Give me an example of where, when you say that there is a sense of center encroaching into state powers. Give me an example that you believe is a sign, uh, an ominous portent for the future. I'll give you two examples. One is education. <clears throat> now, a state government uses state government funds, sets up government medical colleges and naturally it is meant for most people who are belong to that state domicile of that state but nobody denies um, the right of anyone who migrates to a state like Tamil Nadu or Kerala to claim domicile after five years or ten years now today the state governments have no power to decide who will be admitted to those colleges. State government, state government funds, tax paid by the people of that state, they set up government colleges, largely to admit students who are domiciled in that state. Why should the center decide who will be admitted and who will not be admitted? Mm -hmm. Another example, cooperative sector. Now for the last 73 years, the cooperative sector has been entirely under the state government. Mm -hmm. And there have been very, very successful cooperative movements in this country, cooperative societies, cooperative banks, cooperative milk societies. Now, why should the center now create a ministry of cooperation and put the most powerful minister, apart from the prime minister, in charge? And all the banks, all the cooperative banks, all the multi-state cooperative societies, are all reporting to the center now. Now, these are clearly encroachment into the executive and legislative powers of the state government. No, is this center versus states, or is it an all-powerful BJP government versus opposition-ruled states? Because I don't sense, say, from example, from a Naveen Patnaik, who seemed to be close to the Modi government, or indeed BJP-ruled governments objecting to what you're claiming is misuse of centers, executive powers, it's primarily the opposition ruled state. So is the real problem that the compact between an all-powerful center ruled by the BJP in the opposition ruled states has broken down? The correct way to describe the problem is center versus state. Except, of course, the BJP chief ministers are mute witnesses. If they protested, they may not be chief ministers tomorrow. You know, Mr. Chidambaram, it's almost as if you are suggesting that these problems emerged only in 2014. 
I didn't you know, say that. You, you I are a Congress that. person. The Congress for 90 times, Indira Gandhi, Mr. Modi said this on the floor of the house, said Mrs. Indira Gandhi used Article 356 90 times and used the Article 50 times to dismiss governments in the 1970s and 80s. We are, we are mixing up issues. You asked me about the all-powerful center encroaching mm -hmm. into states' rights. And I gave you examples of executive encroachment, um, legislative encroachment. Mm -hmm. Now you are switching to a completely different subject. Article 356, imposition of president's rule. Until S.R. Bombay's case, the law was understood differently. Not only Indira Gandhi, Charan Singh, Muraji Desai understood the law differently. Therefore, after S.R. Bombay's judgment, where has the center, whenever it's ruled by the Congress, exceed its powers? Therefore, I think the watershed is S.R. Bombay's case. Yeah, the there was one was... case in Bihar, for example, when uh, Abdul Kalam, while he was in Moscow, was virtually forced to dismiss a Bihar government. You're saying that's an exception? That's not the real issue at the moment. You believe governments will not be dismissed? I think dismissing a government unless there is a very, very well-documented case of constitutional breakdown is wrong. Article 356 did not um, al allow for such dismissal. But then again, this is part of legal history of India. Um, we can only look back and say the wrong things were done by all governments of the center. And the law was set straight in S.R. Bumai's Okay, case. so you, you admit in a way that there was this overreach in the 1970s when Mrs. Gandhi was in power. You're admitting that. We'll <laughs> now come from there to the present. You're, you're making it as though I'm in the witness box and you're a prosecutor and you want me to make a confession. I'm stating a view, a legal view. Okay. I, I the law just... was differently understood. The okay. law was uh, later better understood. Okay, I was stating facts. Let's come to certain facts of today. One concern, for example, particularly in the southern states where we are and increasingly across the country, and we saw a Supreme Court verdict on it in Maharashtra a couple of weeks ago, is the role of the governor. In your home state of Tamil Nadu, there's a growing friction between the DMK-led government there and the governor. Governor is allegedly sitting on uh, on legislation, even wants the name of the chair state to be changed. In Maharashtra, uh, government was allegedly toppled with the help of the governor how do you see that is that all part of what you're seeing a breakdown in trust and the misuse of constitutional functionaries you are making it a, a legal issue it's far more sinister the bjp's agenda is one india centralism centralism of the kind we find in turkey we find in China, we find in Russia. They believe in centralism. And uh, centralism has a history in uh, world political history. The BJP does not believe in states being near equal partners with the center. Therefore, what is happening over the last four or five years is, I think, far more sinister than saying uh, misusing this power or misusing that power. They are moving towards a one India concept, which with a dominant principle will be centralism. Uh, one voter list, one ration card, um, uh, one language, um, one syllabus, uh, one history, uh, one culture. We are all rebelling against that strongly. And at the grassroots level, at least as far as the southern Indian states are concerned, there is a very deep concern about this um, uh, marauding uh, BJP. So you're saying the governor is, uh, is only a, uh, a tool to push this idea of one India, one India this the sinister governor, idea that you're calling it. The governor you mentioned is clearly a uh, part of this game. The governor of Tamil Nadu is clearly a part of that uh, design. No, but uh, Mr. Chidambaram, the question emerges, will there be a pushback? 
will the will the states there are powerful chief ministers as well will you see a pushback and will that pushback deepen the friction we had the prime minister for example have a meeting the other day of chief ministers only the bjp rule chief ministers attended it the opposition rule chief ministers congress and its allies did not even attend that meeting uh, we've seen even when the new parliament building uh, was inaugurated the opposition boycotted it are we seeing therefore a complete breakdown in a way of trust between the center and the government and unwillingness to talk to each other i hope it doesn't lead to a complete breakdown of trust there is a pushback i can name at least half a dozen chief ministers who are pushing back bengal tamil nadu telangana kerala uh, some other states uh, chatisgarh himachal they are pushing back and if uh, some regional parties get elected or re-elected to form the state governments they will also push back the bjp won't push back for the bjp the bjp structure has already adopted centralism you see it's very interesting you're saying there will be a push back one of the chief ministers you didn't mention just now is the delhi chief minister arvin kejriwal who claims that this latest ordinance uh, of the center taking over services against a supreme court judgment it design is designed for complete control of the center over delhi he is going across the country seeking support the one party that is ambivalent over supporting a kejriwal is the congress party because congress has its own problems with mr kejriwal so is this a principled fight or is this an opportunistic fight the issue that you mentioned has two dimensions one is legal and one is political the legal view i have already expressed myself the legal view is that this ordinance which eventually will become law may not become law i don't know is clearly contrary to article 239 aa mm -hmm. so i think this ordinance is bad it will be struck down 2018 there was a five judge bench delivering a judgment 2023 was another five judge bench delivering a judgment reiterating the principle and there will be another five judges bench which will pronounce on that the political conclusion the political um, uh, lesson that has to be drawn and the political step that has to be taken is uh, beyond my competence i can't say that it can only be said by the congress president after consulting all the uh, stakeholders no, no what is your view mr chidambaram you can't escape that by saying the congress I president can. will because I, I, see, I then, can. then i say it's not a matter of principle no, if you <laughs> say an ordinance has been brought in illegally wrongly why doesn't the congress stand up and say it's illegal and wrong listen you are accusing me of not expressing my view i will express my view in an inner party forum i cannot express my view in an india today forum how can i express my view i still am a member of the party Okay, we thought this was as important a forum as the Congress Party forum for a moment. <laughs> I wish uh, you good luck. <laughs> uh, but, but Mr. Chidambaram, let me give you another example from the center's perspective, uh, and this is in the context of Tamil Nadu, your home state. The NEET exam. Uh, Tamil Nadu says we don't want one ex common. You say one India. The BJP says there will be one common entrance exam, medical exam for the country. Tamil Nadu says we are moving in legislation. We will be out of the NEET system. so states also are rebelling in a way virtually saying even for the manner in which a national exam is to be held we will take the call not the center what is this national exam you're talking about great doctors of tamil nadu dr rangachari dr guru sami mudaliyar dr lakshmana sami mudaliyar they were all admitted to these very colleges by the state government and they became world famous distinguished doctors why can't you trust a state government to admit competent qualified students to state government colleges in a central university let the centers writ run mm -hmm. but i am the state government i build colleges out of my funds it is largely meant for the domiciles of my state why can't i uh, select the, um, the skilled qualified students and admit them Uh, are you saying all the doctors um, who who made um, uh, medical services in tamil nadu famous famous at least throughout the country 
We're all incompetent doctors, and only the neat selected doctors will be competent. What, what kind of an argument is? It's an argument that should be stated to be rejected. One of the other friction points, for example, is the alleged misuse of the CBI and the Enforcement Directorate. That the CBI and the Enforcement Directorate are swooping into states run by the opposition to target opposition politicians. ED raids jumped 27 times during 2014 to 22 compared to the previous 10 years. Do you believe that these enforcement agencies are also part of this growing center state conflict? Because the center says, look, we are targeting those where we have found prima facie instances of corruption, of money laundering. Why do you accuse us? of simply uh, targeting opposition rule governments, that's the part of the ED and the CBI's remit. Do you believe in uh, uh, any principles of statistics? Do I believe in? Any fundamental theorem, theories or theorems of statistics as yes, a science? Yes, facts. How is it that the accused, alleged accused, 95% of them belong to opposition party. How do you explain that? If the law of averages, if the un underlying principles of statistics will apply, I hope it applies in India, then there should be a certain proportion of the BJP ministers, BJP MPs, BJP MLAs, BJP party leaders who should also be raided, isn't it? The BJP I turns must, around and I, says, please tell Mr. Chidambaram <laughs> to go to the court. If Mr. Chidambaram believes that the ED is being misused, that there are cases which are not being investigated against BJP ruled states, please go to the court and get an order. Listen, we are not talking about involving the court. All I'm saying is, if the agencies are completely independent, not goaded by somebody, not nudged by somebody, why is the numbers so skewed against the opposition and so skewed in favor of the BJP. And then, worse, people against whom raids took place, notices were issued, you go through that washing machine, the giant washing machine, <laughs> all of them become innocent. What happened to the notices? What happened to the raids? What happened to the searches? You want me to give names of people who were raided notices issued under, by ED and CBI, inquired, and then all those cases have been buried. You know them as well as I do. Now, so are you suggesting, therefore, given what you're saying about enforcement agencies, CBI, who should step in? If you believe that this has resulted in a situation of a, of a complete misuse, in this case I'm using the word misuse, of central agencies to target opposition state rule governments, do you have a solution? Should the, who should step in to ensure that every case which is followed follows due process? Should it be the courts? Who does it? See, the courts interfere by exception. The court can't run the administration. Court can't run the agencies. That's not the business of a court. It's only when a case comes to the court, the court can pronounce a judgment. You are, you are giving executive powers to the courts to supervise investigations, to supervise the agency. It's not so. That is the duty of the prime minister, mm -hmm. the home minister, and the minister in charge of the agency. Now, those ministers um, bow down to the wishes of the prime minister and um, nudge agencies to go after the opposition leaders, it's a complete breakdown of the system. The only way it can be corrected is for the people to decide, this is not on. This will lead to disaster. What is not on? This kind of misuse of agencies at the instance of the political executive. Many will say, many observers of politics will say that all of this is because as I said, a fundamental mistrust between the government and the opposition, as evinced in, in, in your decision to boycott parliament. Here is a new parliament building coming up. The opposition says we will not attend a ceremony because the prime minister is not inaugurated, uh, uh, because the, we don't accept the prime minister inaugurating it, the president has to inaugurate it. No, no. What's the message again? Please don't mix up 
uh, the non-participation in the inaugural function with the misuse of agencies. Uh, there are, they are very two different things. All right, I'll give you an answer. No, I'm, I'm just looking I'll give at you the, an yes, answer. yeah, go ahead. Have you, has anyone got a copy of the Constitution? Read Article 79. What does Article 79 say? Parliament shall consist of the President and the two houses of par Parliament called Council of States and House of the People. We are focusing on the first 10, 12 words. Parliament shall consist of the President and the two houses of Parliament. Now, the two houses of Parliament are brick and mortar, of course, but they have about 750 members, including me. We all got an invitation. Inviting the 750 members is inviting the two houses of Parliament. Why was an invitation not sent to the President of India? I'm not talking about inaugurating. Why was an invitation not sent to the President of India when the Constitution says Parliament shall consist of the President and the two houses of Parliament? The argument again there, and I'm sorry to do what about tree here, is what happened when the Congress was in power? Did what happened inaugurate? when the Parliament Library, for example, <laughs> was being inaugurated, or the Parliament Annex, Rahul Gandhi, uh, Rajiv Gandhi, and indeed Mrs. Gandhi no, at the time? No. I expected the question. Good, I'm glad. I, I'm ready with an answer. Oh, I'm Unfortunately, glad. there's no Article 79, Capital A, which says Parliament shall consist of the Parliament Library, Parliament shall consist of the Parliament Annex. <laughs> I mean, these are these are additional buildings. We are talking about Parliament House. We are talking about the two houses of Parliament enshrined in the Constitution, along with the President. When you invite the members of the Lok Sabha, we invite the members of the Rajya Sabha, why did you forget to invite the President? A senior BJP leader told me that the real problem is many Congress leaders, he didn't mention you specifically, have not come to terms with the fact that Narendra Modi is a two-time Prime Minister. That that is fundamentally the problem. He isn't seen by your leadership as someone, therefore, who deserves to be in that post. And in some way, therefore, there is this boycott almost of Prime Minister Modi. Completely wrong. Wherever I've written referring to the Prime Minister, I refer to him as Honorable Prime Minister. Wherever Mrs. Gandhi has met with the, uh, in a parliament central hall function or any function, she has been extremely deferential and uh, greets him. Uh, Congress president um, has been in conversation with him. We have seen videos. We accept the fact that the, Mr. Narendra Modi is the elected prime minister of India. Nobody questions his legitimacy. What we are questioning is his actions, his decisions, like the recent uh, Tughlaqian decision of introducing a 2,000 rupee note and withdrawing a 2,000 rupee note. <laughs> On the day it was introduced, I said, this is a foolish decision. The withdrawal is a good decision, but a good decision that corrected a foolish decision. Oh, you know, Mr. Chidambaram, the reason again this uh, this is asked for, if you were in Mr. Modi's uh, position, if you were advising him, what would you tell him? How would you repair this divide? It is a gaping divide. It's a friction point which you say is only going to get worse. What, therefore, would you advise him? Well, the first uh, caution I'll tell myself is your advice will not be accepted. One. And nevertheless, <laughs> nevertheless, if you want me to advise, I'll say, listen. Governments are elected Governments are also unelected. Everybody who's occupied that chair will have to vacate that chair. Maybe five years, 10 years, 12 years, whatever, whatever. Uh, I wish him well. So you must always remember that these are temporary seats of power, which is why I believe in limiting the term of chief executives, like the US president. Is there anything, any job in this world more complex, more difficult uh, than the President of the United States? Why did they impose a two-term limit? 
Because I think it's important to impress upon every elected leader, listen, you are elected, no doubt, you are legitimate, but one day you'll have to vacate the seat. So I would tell him, uh, uh, Honorable Prime Minister, let's proceed on the basis that one day this seat will be vacated by you and somebody else will occupy the seat. And keep that in mind before you take a decision. So you're saying 10 years, maximum no, term, I'm two not, term Prime Minister. I'm not imposing a term. All but you're I'm, suggesting a term. All I'm saying is limiting the terms is good for the state and the center. Let me come, sir, to another dimension of this problem, which is perhaps going to become more and more important in the years ahead, and particularly because we are here in deep south or up south, as we are calling it, will become more critical, which is delimitation. In 2026, there is a belief that the number of parliamentary seats from the most populous north states will increase, and the south could either suffer a loss of seats or their numbers will certainly not increase in the same proportion. How worried are you about what delimitation could do to already the fraught relationship between center and the southern states in particular? See, my party has not yet taken a view. Therefore, you have to take my words with a large dose of caution. This is not necessarily my party view. I'm concerned because either the states which have reached a replacement rate of population growth or even less. For example, many southern states have reached 1.6. The replacement rate is 2.1. They will suffer either by a loss of seats or by their seats being frozen. Whichever way, relatively, as a relation to each other, relatively, the northern states, the uh, states where the population is growing at more than 2.1 percent, will gain. This, I think, uh, could become a cause for friction. Um, how it will be resolved, I have not thought through it. I'm thinking about it. I've not thought through it because I think uh, the unalterable principle, which is um, uh, in the Constitution is one man, one person, one vote. Now, therefore, one has to think through. And I think it's good if all the political parties sit down and calmly think it through. Um, I don't want a situation where uh, nobody thinks it through and then 2026 uh, dawns on you and then the um, uh, thing gathers its own momentum, that will lead to serious issues. I think all political parties should start thinking about it even now, what we, what, what we should do in 2026. What you're saying is whatever decision is taken must be by consensus, not unilateral. Absolutely, absolutely. This is far too sensitive an issue uh, for a government with a majority in the Lok Sabha to take a decision. Mr. Chidambaram, uh, in conclusion, uh, your leader Rahul Gandhi uh, is in the United States and as always, every time he goes abroad, he creates headlines for some reason or the other. Today's headline is, he was in uh, Washington where he has said the Muslim League when asked a question and presumably a it is a reference to the Indian Union Muslim League, which is in your state and in Kerala, uh, is a secular organization. Do you concur with his views that the Indian U U uh, IUML is a secular group? I know the structure of the Muslim League in Kerala and Tamil Nadu. Many of them are known to me. Tamil Nadu leaders are known to me. I believe they are secular. You believe I, it's a I believe they are secular. I don't know about the Muslim League. What's your League. definition of secular? Secular is that you don't indulge in hate against any other community. You don't um, uh, inject a dose of religiosity into every statement action, and you don't create a communal divide between the Muslim communities and the non-Muslim communities. But now you are referring to the Muslim League in Tamil Nadu, not necessarily in Those Canada. are the only two units I know. In many states, the IUML is not a very 
uh, uh, very significant organization. Would you see Mr. Oasis' organization differently? Oasis is not the Indian Union Muslim League. I know, uh, AIMIM, but you see him as I not don't, secular? I don't agree with uh, Mr. Oasis' thinking or speeches. Okay. I, in conclusion, as, as we end, uh, the southern Indian states also feel that they account for 30% of the country's GDP as per RBI figures, around 30%. The five states, they could, some of them could become trillion dollar economies on their own. Do you see that also becoming a point of friction going ahead? You've been the finance minister of the country. Many of these states feel they are contributing uh, disproportionately to the national exchequer and getting disproportionately less. See, I believe in a united India. I believe that uh, the more prosperous states must take some part of the burden of the backward states. That's my belief. But there is a serious concern in the southern states that when it comes to the finance commission, their share of the revenues is dwindling from one commission to another. When I was finance minister also, the share dwindled. Yes. Shred Dindal and everybody protested. Therefore, we have to rethink the Finance Commission's mandate. That is one. Secondly, there is a feeling that in the grants and aid, uh, which are not necessarily Finance Commission uh, uh, directed, where the central government has a large uh, area of discretion, the grants in aid also, and in the borrowings, right to borrow. For example, Kerala Chief Minister is protesting that his right to borrow is being severely restricted. I think there are serious issues. I know the language of the Constitution provisions, but they were written at a different time. They were different. Uh, they, they were written by in a different um, uh, scenario. So we'll have to review those provisions of the Constitution so that the more advanced states don't feel that they are being shortchanged um, uh, compared to the less advanced states. I won't call them backward, they are less advanced states. I think it's absolutely necessary to look at the center state fiscal relations chapter of the Constitution and take a second look at it. So what you're saying basically, whether it's center state fiscal relations, whether it's delimitations, try and build consensus, try and work together, have all party, more all party meetings, hopefully attended by both sides. I'll give you an example. Yes. We built a consensus on a GST. In fact, if our government had been in office, the GST law would be a very different law, more, uh, in, more in line with uh, the paper put out by um, uh, Arvind Subramanian. But the animal that's come out today, the GST, has no resemblance to the consensus we built. Remember, Yashwan Sana constituted the, uh, the group of ministers. And I took over, and we worked with them for seven years, building a consensus on GST. We successfully built a consensus on VAT, and all the states fell in line. Nobody has any grievance about VAT. Next step was VAT to GST. We were building a consensus. The consensus was ready when Arun Jaitley took over as finance minister. And what has this government done? It has completely distorted the consensus of GST. GST today, many finance ministers have told me, non-BJP finance minister, and even one BJP finance minister has told me, and this is not the consensus that we arrived at when we agreed to sharing sovereignty as far as taxation is concerned. This is completely now dominated, dictated by the center. Even though decisions in the GST council are to be taken by consensus, Mr. That Chitabha. is on paper. You're saying it's on paper? That's on paper. <laughs> okay. So we need to imbibe, embrace the spirit of consensus. And in that spirit of consensus, I hope your idea of a united India and Mr. Modi's idea of one India can merge. United India is very different from one India. <laughs> don't, okay. don't conflate the two. Okay. United India 
has a very different connotation. One India has a very different connotation. In fact, I would say United India is a noble idea. One India, I'm afraid, is a rather sinister idea. <laughs> We we'll leave it at that. Mr. Chidambaram's vision of United India and Mr. Modi's vision of One India, you choose which India is the India of the future. Either way, what we do need is some element of collaboration above all else. Mr. Chidambaram, I hope in the same spirit you'll write a letter and send that to Mr. Modi and uh, tell the Prime Minister of the country that uh, these are my suggestions for a united India. Thank you very much, P. Chidambaram, for joining me here on the news today. Thank you.